Where'd you get it from anyway? Apparently it was the hand of someone who could connect with the dead. Say, talk to me. Talk to me. Haley, f***ing stop it, he's choking! 83 seconds, get it off him! I'm not gonna stop. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with the film Comics Explained. As requested, today we'll be exploring Talk To Me, the recently released supernatural horror written and directed by brothers Danny and Michael Filippo in their directorial debut. Starring Sophie Wilde, Alexander Jensen, Joe Bird, Otis Danji, Marcus Johnson, and Miranda Otto, the Australian horror film introduces us to a group of thrill-seeking teens who find a peculiar pastime, communing with the dead using an embalmed hand, a relic shrouded in mystery. Like every ghostly engagement, this one comes with rules, and when our protagonist Mia pushes the boundaries, the restless spirits are keen to make her pay. The A24 production from the brothers, who rose to prominence with their viral videos on their Raka Raka YouTube channel, uses an original narrative, while winking at established cinematic motifs and real-world rituals, culminating in a hard-hitting finale. Concurrently, the narrative threads Mia's ongoing struggle with her mother's fatal overdose and her desperate attempts to reconnect with her in the afterlife. But as we know, meddling with the dead comes at a cost, and Mia's fate leads us to a gut-wrenching vision of the afterlife that leaves us grappling with more questions than answers. Talk to me. Oh. Hey, hey, don't let go of me. Do not let go. The film kicks off with a booze-filled soiree, where we're introduced to Ari MacArthur's Cole, who's on a quest through a sea of partygoers to find his brother Duckett, played by Sonny Johnson. With everybody reporting Duckett was behaving erratically, and the property owners demanding he be removed from the house, Cole breaks into a room to find him shirtless and mumbling about how their deceased father was telling him awful things. Helping him up, Cole then drags Duckett out and berates the voyeuristic crowd filming the spectacle. But Duckett isn't done with his performance, serving the guests with a horrifying encore, stabbing Cole and then himself in the eye, much to the shock of everyone around him. We then cut to 17-year-old Mia, betrayed by Sophie Wilde, who's dealing with the aftermath of her mother's death by overdose. Communication between her and her father, Marcus Johnson's Max, is almost non-existent, and believing he was keeping something from her about her mother Rhea, Mia instead chooses to spend most of her time with her best friend Jade, played by Alexander Jensen, her little bro, Joe Bird's Riley, and their mum Sue, betrayed by Miranda Otto. On their way home one evening, Mia and Riley find an injured kangaroo on the road, the boys suggest that they end its suffering in an act of mercy. However, although Mia initially agrees, not quite up for the task, she swerves around the animal instead, leaving it to suffer. Trying to forget the horrific sight and cheer up on the two-year anniversary of her mother's death, Mia, Jade, Riley, and Jade's boyfriend Daniel, played by Otis Danji, then attend a party. Surprising the group, the hosts of the party, Zoe Tarakas Haley and Joss, played by Chris Olozio, suggest they play a creepy paranormal game. With nobody offering themselves up and not quite sure what she was getting herself into, Mia agrees to be first up and is strapped into a chair by Joss, who pulls out an embalmed hand with a scribbled inscription to be used to call upon the spirits. Preparing themselves for the ritual, they tell everyone that if you die when they're inside of you, they'll have you forever, and that you must light the candle to open the door and blow the light to close it. Our spectral joyride revolves around a set of rules. Light a candle, grip the embalmed inscription-clad hand, and utter the magic words, talk to me, and I let you in. As Haley lays it out, the experience shouldn't exceed 90 seconds, and upon completion, the candle should be snuffed and the hand released. The film effectively underscores the need for an invitation for a spirit to enter a host. Flap these rules and you risk permanent possession, as the group is soon about to learn the hard way. With the candle lit and guidance from Haley, Mia boldly states, talk to me, and gets spooked by an old man's spirit, she then continues with, I let you in, enabling a grotesque female spirit to take over her body and make its supernatural presence known. Despite their attempts to separate her from the embalmed hand before the 90 seconds were up, Mia holds on longer, morphing into a possessed version of herself that spews out ominous threats at Riley before the hand is finally wrestled from her grip. The actual nature of the disembodied hand in Talk To Me is only ever implied through hearsay by Joss and Haley, the enthusiastic host of the possession parties. Supposedly, the hand is a severed appendage of a medium or a satanist, preserved through embalming and encased in ceramic. Its true nature remains veiled in mystery, but the existence of the established rules passed down to guide its use suggests that it's been in play for quite some time. 
While a little freaked out, exhilarated by the experience, Mia convinces her friends to give it a go. And so, wanting to take part, they meet up with Haley at school and organize for them to all try the ritual that night when her mother Sue was away. At Jade's place, the game picks up again, with our naive group of teens unflinchingly ready to flirt with death. Encounters with the departed escalate to such levels that the good and wholesome Daniel, revealed to be Mia's ex-boyfriend from a few years ago, is possessed by one of the spirits, which forces him to kiss the family dog. Young Riley then insists on his turn, and while Jade furiously storms out, refusing to let him as he was still underage, when he begs Mia, she agrees for him to try the ritual for only 50 seconds. Unfortunately, when he's possessed by what appeared to be Mia's mother, ignoring the 90 second deadline and everyone's plea to separate him from the hand, the girl continues communing with the spirit. Things then take a ghastly turn when Riley goes all fight club on himself, headbutting the table multiple times before being stopped from gouging his own eyes out. It's understandable that when Mia attempts to visit him at the hospital, Jade and Sue slam the door in her face, laying blame for Riley's state at her feet. Abusing the trust of her friend Jade even further, Mia then finds solace in Daniel by inviting him to stay the night with her. While reluctant, with Mia practically begging him by saying she was lonely, Daniel stays only to have his foot become the unsuspecting target of a geriatric host. However, the plot thickens when Mia snaps out of her spectre-induced state to find that she's the culprit behind the foot fiasco, much to Daniel's dismay. Determined to reconnect with her mother, Mia takes the embalmed hand and arranges a solo seance. The ghost delivers a message of her accidental death, reassuring Mia that she would never choose to leave her. Rhea then drops the bomb that Riley needs help, just as Jade gets a taste of his possession-induced rage at the hospital, with the possessed boy continuing to bang his head until he's restrained by the staff. Teaming up with Daniel, Jade, Haley, and Joss, Mia hunts down Cole, who promptly blames them for what happened to his brother. Haley says that Duckett told them the spirits could imitate people, and we learn that Joss met Duckett at some parties, where their group would often play with the embalmed hand, using the rules that were passed down from each owner of the hand. Duckett had effectively let Josh borrow it and, before he died, stated that he was seeing the spirits without using the hand. Of course, he then stabbed his brother Cole and killed himself, tying back to what we saw at the start of the film. Despite his anger, after hearing about Riley's predicament, Cole explains that the apparitions would have just left them alone if they stopped using the hand. He also notes that Riley's body should kick the entity that has possessed him out, as they get weaker the longer they're in someone else's body. Like withdrawal, if a person can hold out for a long time without playing the game, they will get over the quote-unquote psychic addiction they have to the euphoric sensation of possession. It's here that Jade also lets out her grievances, pointing out how Mia took advantage of her family for comfort, but did not reciprocate the care and love they gave her. I mean, not only did she let Riley play the game against Jade's wishes, but she manipulated Daniel into staying with her, instead of being with Jade when she needed him most. Still, while acknowledging her faults, Mia questions whether they'd blown the candle out on Riley's turn. She indicates that while they let the entity in, they might have forgotten to kick it out, hence why the body did not reject the spirit yet. With this, she reasons they need to redo the process with Riley, but this time swiftly blow the candle out to seal the deal, and so, wishing them luck, Haley and Joss advise them to burn the hand when they're done, wanting no further part in this. Unfortunately, the plan does not work, and when Mia uses the hand to try and communicate with Riley himself, the spirit of a child appears and agrees to help them. It lets Mia into their realm, and the sight is one of absolute horror, a limbo of soul obliteration, where rabid spirits are devouring Riley's soul. Talk to Me takes a grim and nihilistic perspective on limbo. It paints a rather bleak picture of the great beyond, a dismal and boundless abyss of torment where the dead, regardless of their earthly virtues or sins, are confined to eternal suffering. No wonder the departed are rather miffed. They're desperate for a chance to return to the realm of the living, hence the 90 second rule to prevent them from outstaying their welcome. Even within this brief window, we see the spirits make the most of their physical liberation, belting out tunes, smacking their lips, and exhibiting a rather carnal desire for life. <laughs> Returning home, Mia's met by her father Max, who comes clean with the tragic truth about Rhea's demise. She didn't overdose by accident, but intentionally, a revelation delivered through her suicide note. But as Mia reels from the truth, Rhea's spirit out a chilling layer, accusing Max of fabricating the note and claiming that Riley's salvation lies in his death. Unfortunately, a violent encounter with the deceptive spirits results in Max getting stabbed in the neck by a disoriented Mia. Beginning to lose her mind in a dramatic switcheroo, Mia lures Jade away from the hospital, granting her a solitary audience with Sue, who absolves Mia of any guilt concerning Riley's condition, and even grants her some time alone with him. 
In a desperate bid to end Riley's torment, Mia contemplates the unthinkable, but ultimately fails to muster the resolve. She then attempts a wheelchair escape with Riley, just as Jay discovers Mac's predicament and realizes Mia's intention. In the climax, Mia is on the brink of sacrificing Riley to free him from his spectral tormentors by pushing his wheelchair into oncoming traffic. But in a devilishly ambiguous shot, we see Mia colliding with the cars and meeting a grisly end on the tarmac. We're left guessing whether Jade shoved Mia, or if Mia decided to offer herself to the spirits in exchange for Riley's life, or maybe, just maybe, she couldn't bear her mother's spirit nudging her towards homicide. Awakening from her corporeal form in the hospital, Mia immediately follows Jade, Sue, the rejuvenated Riley, and her father Max, who seems to have dodged the Grim Reaper, mirroring Cole's survival in the opening sequence. Here, the nightmare of the mirror without a reflection, hinted at earlier, comes full circle. The finale sees Mia surrounded by an all-encompassing darkness, with only a distant speck of light as her guide. But here's the kicker. Instead of sauntering off into a bright, happy afterlife, she approaches the light, only to discover that she's become a ghost herself. A new group of youngsters in another country, hand in hand with the embalmed appendage, then beckon her to talk to them. This alludes to the notion that everyone in this limbo had been lured here by the hand, before desperately tricking others to join them, hoping to come back into the real world. I let you in. I let you in. At its core, Talk To Me is an intricate metaphorical journey through the dark woods of grief and the hardship of releasing the past. Whether it's clinging too firmly to a memory or an embalmed hand, the fallout can be catastrophically damaging, not just for the individual, but also for those who care for them. The film symbolizes the despair intertwined with grief and loss through the motif of possession parties. For those ensnared in the jaws of grief and depression, it's often easier to seek refuge in destructive means, be it the numbing embrace of substances or the distractions offered by parties and socializing. There's a very clear parallel to be drawn between substance abuse and Mia's dependency on the embalmed hand. Grief has such a stranglehold over the narrative that we see Mia, albeit subtly, navigating some of the stages of grief. These encompass shock and denial, guilt and pain, anger and bargaining, depression, reflection and loneliness, the upward turn, reconstruction and working through, culminating in acceptance and hope. Each person traverses these stages in their own unique order, and we see Mia ticking quite a few of these boxes. Shock and denial make their presence known in Mia's obstinate refusal to accept her mother's suicide and her blinkered vision clouded by the spirit's deception. Mia is effectively a vessel for guilt and pain, not only revolving around her mother's suicide, but also concerning Riley's injuries, for which she's partly to blame. Her simmering anger towards her father is palpable, and the loneliness she felt prior to bonding with Jade and Riley comes to the surface in several instances. It's a pity, however, that Mia never traverses the final three stages, with the optimism of reconstruction, acceptance, or hope being replaced by despair as she's devoured by the perils of the embalmed hand and becomes a lost soul herself. This tragic arc is ominously foreshadowed by the gut-wrenching scene with the kangaroo at the very beginning, where Mia is unable to put the severely injured creature out of its misery. She basically refuses to take the necessary steps towards closure, choosing instead to let the creature endure pain in an effort to shield herself from more sorrow. Mia's stubborn resistance to moving on from her past is the driving force behind her actions throughout Talk To Me, which culminates in a tragic finale. She's swallowed by her own loneliness and grief, which will now haunt her for eternity, as she wanders in limbo as a lost spirit. No. Please. It's my mum's remembrance day. I just want to forget about it. I could see and feel everything on the other side. So my mum, she was trying to reach out. While the narrative skeleton is familiar territory to anyone who knows their possession horror, the Filippo brothers breathe new life into it, with a few intriguing twists and a grounded approach. The line between objective reality and Mia's demonic tainted perspective is beautifully blurred. We see great use of practical effects, stellar cinematography, and a unique and effective sound design that supports an amazing cast. There's an ongoing ambiguity about whether the ghostly apparition of Mia's mother Rio, played hauntingly by Alexandria Stephenson, is a bona fide spirit or a demonic charlatan, and the brothers don't speed feed us the answer. From a tormented rue breathing its last in the middle of the road to a stark scene of appalling violence, Talk To Me doesn't hold back on delivering the blood chilling elements that set it apart. First off, we've got Sophie Wilde, who admirably shoulders the film by portraying a character ridden with grief, craving closure, and terrified at the horror she's unwittingly set into motion. Her transformation during the possessions, along with that of the other teens, is amazing, and I was thrilled to see the commitment they had in those scenes. 
Mia is a tragic protagonist that doesn't learn from her mistakes, and the film doesn't hold back to let you know how addiction and the inability to let go can destroy your soul. Then there's Joe Bird, delivering a portrayal of a good kid pressured into making a bad decision and forced to deal with the terrifying consequences of this action. Alexandra Jensen is also solid as Jade, the loving and considerate friend who opens her home to Mia, only for her friend to take advantage of their family for her own personal needs. The betrayal she feels is intense, and the movie gives her an opportunity to tell Mia the depth of her pain and disappointment. Otis Danji was great as Daniel, a nice guy with split loyalties that also gets taken advantage of, while both Chris Elosio and Zoe Tarakis deliver commendable performances as Joss and Haley, two near dwells with personality. It's no surprise that Miranda Otto nails her to Sue, a single mother with a healthy relationship with her kids that is shocked to see them betray her trust. Otto adds so much wit, humor, anger, and love to her limited screen time, showcasing her range with ease, while Marcus Johnson also delivers a commendable performance as a broken father trying his best to reconnect with his wayward daughter. It really would have been nice to see more of their relationship, making the tragedy of Mia's demise all the more heartbreaking for Max. Sure, Talk To Me has its roots embedded deep in its genre, and echoes the Insidious franchise with its boy trapped in purgatory trope, but the film also illustrates precisely how indie horror films can be so inventive. In an era where horror flicks are becoming increasingly safe, using cheap thrills and easy scares rather than the gnawing dread that keeps you up at night, Talk To Me is an uncompromising shot of real, gut-clenching horror. Hats off to the Filippos, they've taken their budget constraints, young cast, effective filmmaking techniques and dark subject matter to tell an original allegorical tragedy about troublesome youth in the suburbs. The Hand is a physical representation of the themes. Uh, the film is about connections, true ones and false ones, and The Hand is a false connection. With that said, that's all for today folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we cover Talk To Me. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and also check out the Film Comics Explained podcast on the second channel. Our latest video on The Happening was heaps of fun, and if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. You busy tonight? You want to turn, eh? My mum leaves at nine. So you're at ten. <laughs> what did the hand feel like? felt amazing. What if we opened the door but we didn't shut it? Delete it. Delete it, come on!